Now, as the year draws to a close, it's time to look back on 2023 and look forward to the year ahead. It was a year that Nigerians really started to ask hard questions of their leaders and of those who hoped to lead. It was a year that awakened Nigeria's youth to the power of their vast numbers and the belief that they could send this country in a new political direction, a year in which Nigerians sought to find new champions of change for better, not worse, amid deepening divisions, dwindling revenues and rising poverty. But a year in which many such hopes were dashed. And what about 2024? Is it likely to be any easier than 2023? Will the economy get better? Will insecurity worsen? Will the political crisis in River State deepen? And on the international stage, could we easily end up with Donald Trump back in the White House? And are we likely to see a widening regional conflict in the Middle East? Well, let's take a reflective journey now through the months of the dying year. And for this, I'm joined by three of Nigeria's most distinguished analysts. The noted political scientist, Professor Jibrini Ibrahim, chair of the editorial board of Nigeria's Premium Times newspaper and senior fellow at the respected think tank, the Center for Democracy and Development. The political analyst and the executive director of Development Specs Academy, Professor O.K. Ikechuku, who is a member of the editorial board of This Day newspaper and is also a professor of strategic management and human capital development. And the current affairs analyst and professor of communications at Bayes University in Abuja, Professor Abiodun Adeni. Gentlemen, thank you very much indeed for joining us uh, this special edition of Arise prime time. And let me come to you first, uh, Professor Ibrahim. Um, we'll start on a slightly different note. We're at that time of the year when in many countries, including Nigeria, people celebrate the festive season. And obviously, we, when we celebrate, we tend to eat as part of the occasion. I mean, what's your favorite festive food? Uh, I mean, what which celebration dish would you say gets your mouth watering the most? I think for all Nigerians, almost as if it were law, jollof rice is the object of any festive uh, season. And as you know, we produce the very best jollof rice in the world. And uh, just as an anecdote, when a British uh, chef tried to package jollof rice on the internet, you recall he got 2.5 million insults from angry Nigerian. That's a good way to start. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. And let me come to you, Professor Oke Ikechuku. This time of year is usually a sort of jostling, bustling panic of things to do before the big days of Christmas and New Year arrive. What are the things that you find yourself doing at the end of the year? Well, just before Christmas, you prepare for Christmas, but more from the angle of, okay, Christmas is the celebration of the birth of Christ and salvation. So it's not just about the festivities, festivities it's also about asking yourself, all right, based on the teachings he brought, how well have I lived this year? Can I say that this commemoration is real for me? Then it's also a time to look at the year that has passed, evaluate your actions and activities, look at the things that went well and why they went well, look at the things that didn't go so well and why they didn't, whether it was your fault or circumstantial. Then, most importantly, look at the operating environment. Is it progressing in terms of values? The prospects you're seeing are the economic, spiritual, and social and political angles. Right. What are they likely to translate into? in the new year. So it's a time of orientational uh, review and revaluation preparatory towards what we might call a new year, but which a good deal of the time turns out to carry much of the old year. Well, we'll get to more of that in a moment. And Professor Abiodun Adeni, of course, as we mentioned, the festive season is upon us uh, with fridges stuffed to bursting point with food. I mean, if we were to look in your refrigerator what would we find there for christmas lunch or dinner 
<laughs> okay. Um, uh, thanks a lot, um, Charles. And uh, but I think as you mature in age, sometimes what you eat is not necessarily determined um, by the atmosphere or what's in the air. Uh, but largely by what suits um, your system, as the case could be. Um, so I think, yes, I see people around me, you know, fancy jello fries, but I, I look more at the things, you know, um, that will be healthy for me. Um, I hardly, I, I, I'm hardly carried away, you know, uh, by the festivities, even though, uh, you know, I sometimes participate uh, in the celebrations as the case could be. But of course, like my colleague said, it's a moment of reflection, a moment of introspection, you know, uh, for rightful projection into the year ahead. And personally, it's a period of the time, the eulogial period at least, you know, um, which actually herads my birthday. You know, my birthday is the 31st of December, so it's more, uh, um, spiritual for me um, than anything else, you know. So I guess I began, I think I just want to enjoy uh, the moment because the time I'm always um, also more indoors, you know, the routine um, requirement of having to uh, resume at work is not, is not there, at least maybe for a few days, you know. I look at outstanding journal articles, outstanding books that I still have to deliver on and make plans on how to get them through in the year ahead, as the case could be, Charles. Well, thank you for that. And let's now leap straight into what you were talking about there, about that assessment going forward. And let me come to you, <laughs> Professor Jibrin Ibrahim, from a political point of view. Does 2023, broadly speaking, feel like a pretty unsavory year for you? Elections held? Lots of dashed hopes, lots of you can hardly make it up stories. Well, I think in a sense it's a normal year for us Nigerians because we don't really remember a year where violence hasn't increased, where killings haven't increased, where kidnappings haven't increased, where state incompetence hasn't been more evident. So I think we just note that another normal year has come and gone. And maybe the big thing for me for this year is actually the big event that never held. The 2023 population census was supposed to start 3rd May and it never took place because there was too much incompetence in planning for it, but also as putting it one week after the elections. No country in the world has seen will plan a massive event elections and the next week another massive elect event, the census. So it's not that normal year for us Nigerians. We are used to the incompetence. <laughs> Well, on that rather unsavoury <laughs> note, let me come to you, Professor Oke Ikechuku. Of course, the end of the year, just coming off the back of Professor Ibrahim there, feels rather like the embarrassing end of the Roman Empire, doesn't it? With the crisis in River State brewing, complete with all the excesses of, you know, cheap innuendos of Nigerian politics. Well, I, quite frankly, I think this is one of the best years Nigeria has had since independence. And I'll tell you why I think so. When false identities, you know, there's a presumption that assuming a new government comes in, makes everything to go very well, that Nigerians are then good in themselves and will go ahead and everything will be well. Let's look at it. I think... This year is one of the most dramatic in unraveling the fraud called the average person, not people in office. Beginning from uh, the elections, let's even look at the dynamics and logistics. It was projected that Tinubu will not get the ticket. And within the context of that, things like Naira design was, redesign was mentioned. His own acolytes came out to challenge him on the ticket, came out on the podium in APC, they lost. Then the many elections, it was envisaged that, oh, he wouldn't even be allowed to contest. It didn't happen. Then elections held Supreme Court, nothing happened. Now, let's look at this within the context of a nation that's presumably on the right track. The international community were there. Nothing happened. The alleged powerful people in Nigeria, elder statesmen and elder states, whatever, they're here. 
So what we see is a progressive, steady unraveling of the nation towards a path of greater political maturity. So I don't share the pessimism. I don't share the assumption that anything bad is happening. Where you have a lot of unruly children who are kept under control by the hammer or the cane, it does not translate into the father that those children are of good behavior on their own. Now it's like things have been loosened up and we are seeing what people really are. If today I win an election by fraudulent means, one thing you can be sure of is that I'm not the one who went to carry the ballot box. And that the people who did it did not refuse and say this is bad. So for me, this is one of the most critical years of national political evolution. And evolution, if you put a seed in the soil, the first thing that will happen is that it will decay. So it's a year of decay towards a rebirth, a lot of economic discomfort. Yes, the fuel price is biting. The palliatives are not there, but let's also recalibrate and be honest about it. If Atiku had won the elections, he would have removed the fuel price. That's what he claimed. If P2B had won it, he would have. So these are measures which everybody said it, would have, it, was, it was good to take. Now it's been taken clearly, precipitously, and without sufficient preparation. These other people who allegedly have solutions, have they brought the solutions for what? This is about our country. So looking at here, also events building up to the River State crisis, right. the foundations for that was laid in the elections. And one thing any keen observer will note about, uh, about River State is that Wike is in process of being taken to the burial ground politically. Well, we're, we're, we're going to get to the River State um, crisis because obviously that's a big, big event, uh, especially going into 20, at the end of 2023, likely to run into 2024. But before we get there, let me come to you, Professor Adeni. Do you think the Nigerian public paid much attention to politics this year than they normally would because it was a presidential election year? Okay, first, Charles, let me create a contest. You know, uh, if, if I uh, remember my history right, I remember in 1870s somewhat, um, the Anglicans were somewhat critical of the Catholics, you know, where when they declared um, the, the pontiff, the Catholic pontiff as infallible. And of course, in describing the year when this declaration was made, um, they used the word annus horribilis. That was in 1870. And fast forward to 1992, uh, the late Queen also referred to 1992 as um, Anus Horribilis. So, so um, the Queen helped up somewhat um, to re-energize that concept and coming after 1992 we had had uh, former UN Secretary Kofi Annan referring to um, one other year, 2004, you know, as Anus Horribilis. So it's been um, a, like a term used to describe a year where things are horrible. And I will not say that we have witnessed a horrible year in Nigeria in 20, 1993 and, and therefore it's not um, an annus horribilis, but rather annus mirabilis, because of the many amazing year, amazing things that has, that happened in Nigeria in the year under review, and many of these amazing things, no doubt, so many contradictions, so many things that we thought um, could never happen here, but happen. Sometimes you look as if um, we are headed for the tailspin, but so, uh, somehow again witness a revival. We, we, we have witnessed this at the political scene. Yeah, my colleagues have mentioned it exhaustively. But there are also other areas that should interest us, really. Um, we witnessed some victories, irrespective of the many downsides that we are wont to identify. Of course, we had a Nigerian emerging as the best cook, you know, maybe entertainment, maybe an intangible, maybe an unserious aspect of it. But of course, it has a way of rubbing off slightly on our brand. And so again, we had a situation where a Nigerian emerged as the best um, African footballer, you know, after like two decades of absence, somewhat gratifying as well. But again, you also conflate it with the fact that it was a year where we had the unfortunate murder of Deborah Samuel, and it was a year where we had the bombing of innocent civilians somewhere in Kaduna as the case could be. So you could see this confliction, but overall we are here reviewing a year that is not markedly different from the Nigerian character, the overall overarching Nigerian character. 
which is why overall you will say every year in Nigeria could best be described as annual solubilis, but because we need to um, invest our hope in the future, begin to be, um, have some level of optimism because there's a way in which our mindsets, you know, the configuration of our psychology can propel us into a real action, then of course we begin to look at it, rather, instead of saying it's the years of what we can describe as horribilis, we would rather um, look at it within the context of um, mirabilis, right. so that we can propel ourselves at the level of value, right. at the level of energy, psychology logical, but intangible, but also very powerful and potent, potent Charles. Okay. Well, that, that, um, that's a good way to put it. And if we could all be a little bit more brief in our analysis, that way we can get to everything. But let me come to you, Professor uh, Ibrahim. Um, it, we, I think uh, Professor Kekic would touched on River State earlier. A lot of the politics of Nigeria for this year has ended up focusing on River State, the crisis revolving around the dominant figure of Nyesa Mwike that Professor Okeikejuku mentioned there. Does it deserve, do you think, to be titled Wike Gate? Well, <laughs> I, I don't think there's anything specifically Wike about it because the fact of the matter is that at least three quarters of Nigerian governors living office have tried to install their boy in office who they had hoped, always hoped, to control and to continue to rule the state after their mandate has uh, finished. It's some sort of universal disease all governors uh, suffer from. So Wiki is just an a run-of-the-mill ordinary governor who wanted a boy installed who will obey him and who will continue to serve him his 40-year-old uh, whiskey. But as has happened for the maybe 12th, 13th time, some of these boys, when they are installed, suddenly realize, well, actually, the person who installed me did so because of the powers of being governor. And uh, I've been told I'm now the governor. Therefore, why should I be pushed around? Shouldn't I be the one now pushing everybody around and imposing my will as the almighty governor of the state? So in a sense, it's a normal process we've seen so many times. The only difference now is the stylistic one. Wiki is somebody who loves drama. He loves being brash. He loves being seen as somebody who is unpredictable and can take drastic action. And sometimes you can overplay that game of brashness. And what's clear is that he's overplaying the brashness. OK, we shall return to uh, Nyesam Wike and the uh, political crisis unfolding in River State a bit later in the course of the discussion. But I want you to take us, Professor Oke okay, Ike Chuku, into 2024, looking ahead, because obviously the year is not here yet. From an economic point of view, how do you think it's going to go? The, the government is projecting that inflation will fall from nearly 30% to just over 20%. That seems incredibly unrealistic? Or is there a secret weapon that President Tinubu has that will make it possible in your assessment? It's quite possible there is a secret weapon. I don't know the nature of that weapon. But we're talking about economic realities and you're talking about inflation, which is about um, the increase of uh, unit cost for goods. For inflation to drop, there must be increased supply. If that supply is to come from imports, it means there's going to be increased imports. If it's, going to come, if it's going to come from increased local production, you then look at the operating environment. If you note, this year, we've had very, very poor harvests in terms of agricultural products. And so if you're expecting inflation to come down in respect of food items, are you going to import? Why did we have all of that? It's not purely environmental. A lot of farmers couldn't harvest because of banditry. Some places couldn't plant at all. Some harvests were violently taken from the people. 
So to that extent, across all areas of agricultural products, there has been very, very low output. Now, you look at the, the angle of uh, installed capacity for the industries, many people lost their jobs, many companies shut down, and so the goods also, if you're talking about the amount of goods coming into the market, those producing them, their numbers have reduced. Their quantities have also reduced. And then the impact of the national of the value of the Naira has also affected replacement cost. Assuming you're producing, let's say, plastics, you mm -hmm. produce 2 million every day and it costs you 10 million Naira, which at some point was uh, about uh, how much now? 10 million Naira, that's five, uh, how much dollars, whatever. Now, with the new change of the Naira, you're going to spend, with new value of the Naira, you're going to now look for 20 million plus in order to get that. But what you sold has not given you 20 million, so your quantities drop. In mm. terms of output, Naira has also declined. So there might be something I don't know the government is working on to bring down inflation. But in terms of the real politics and the real economics of it on right. the table on terra firma, I, I do not see it. But there might be. Okay. There might well be. But let's go over to Professor Abiodun Adeni. Uh, do you expect that there'll be enormous pressure on President Tinubu in 2024 to create a feel-good factor and to shake off the cost of living crisis and get the economy out of first gear where it's now pretty much been since the APC took over in 2015? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, so a few things happened, uh, Charles, um, a few days ago. Um, there was this cherry news um, that the Portacourt um, refinery was going to be back on stream. You know, we're still, um, we are very hopeful that, you know, um, we'll begin to see uh, production from that uh, refinery. If we have that um, coming into uh, fruition, you know, um, which we expect that in, alongside the Dangote refinery that is steadily making progress, we are being told every day or every other day uh, because, um, about the progress they are making. Um, if we stop the process of having to export crude, you know, and importing refined um, uh, PMS, you know, and of course we expect to see um, less pressure on forex or on um, demand for foreign exchange or whatever, however we want to put it, you know. Um, the pressure on President Bolatino but will definitely continue. Will definitely continue. Well, if some of these uh, cherry developments, some of these cherry news, you know, mature, you know, I will see um, a very rewarding, efficient outcome. I think at the end of the day, the pressure might lessen, you know. But all we need to do is also not to lose sight of um, the macroeconomic environment, you know, the insecurity situation, and what about um, our attitude, you know, towards governance, you know, towards a public office, you know. We still see a lot of profligacy around. We still see um, the tendency for leaders and, of, of course, citizens to be neocolonial in their thoughts, in their patterns, in their particularities, such that we prefer foreign products, we privilege uh, pro foreign products ahead of local products. And all these things simply means that we're exporting capital as against you know, growing uh, what we have or being able to make do with what we have such that we can have retention of capital and of course it can add up, be become helpful to production, become helpful to local consumption, trigger some level of multipliers, enhance job opportunities and enable us overall to have a vibrant um, economy that can be largely be self-reliant. So I think uh, beyond the measures they take on an everyday basis, it's also uh, the need, you know, for an overarching attitudinal change, you know, which can only be propelled or driven by the president or the leaders having a consequential political will. But if the will is still tepid, you know, only at the level of, impl of intention, without deliberate, decided efforts um, to implement, you know, policy projections um, towards or some kind of a meaningful orientation, I think we might just end up begging the issue. And we do not want a situation where the president will just be a timekeeper at the end of the day, um, working in the, in the, on the right. paths of previous leaders, but somebody who will be, make meaning at the level of um, delivery overall, Charles. Okay. Um, let me move away from talking about the economy, uh, Professor Ibrahim, and talk about reform. I mean, what about INEC and electoral reform? Do you see that happening in 2024? 
Well, I think uh, the key message from the 2023 election is the urgent need for electoral reform to continue. I'm particularly concerned by the fact that politically involved individuals who are partisan and have been seen active in party politics have been appointed into INEC as resident electoral commissioners. That's a red flag for democracy when people that are openly partisan then become declared the umpire for the game. What this tells us is that there is really a problem politically in the country when a national assembly that has been told through petitions from citizens that these people are partisan still goes ahead and clears them to hold that position. In a sense, is a real risk, is a threat to uh, Nigerian democracy that that's happening. And what that tells me is that there's a sense in which the big electoral reform, which are the major recommendations of the OWIS Electoral Reform uh, Committee, have still not been implemented in this country. And while we've done some piecemeal adjustments to the Electoral Act, the big reform is yet to come and 2024, for me, is the year that needs to happen. And uh, Professor Oke Ikechuku, just uh, moving away, because we're trying to gallop ahead so we get to everything. What about security concerns here in Nigeria? Do you expect that the government will get on top of it, or is it just going to be shuffling along? Well, we've been shuffling along so far, but I expect that government should do something about it. I would want to assume that uh, the measures that the terrible experiences, continued terrible experiences from the angle of security this year would have uh, created enough concern for government to tell itself that, look, we can enter 2024 like this. Because if you look at it, the kidnappings are going on, banditry are still on ramp bandits are still on rampage, specifically in the very parts of the country where they've always been on rampage. There is no greater indication of ability to track them one would, uh, these people communicate and all of that. So you don't see any, also there isn't enough indication of synergy. And you may recall that, um, I think that was the former CDS, but we had official communication that the way the military was able to secure the Kaduna Road was by signing an agreement, a three-month renewable agreement with bandits. In other words, you're able to cite people you ought to eliminate, sit down with them, sign a document, that they will not be of bad behavior for a season. And when they start being of bad behavior, you call them again to sign it. That is perfectly scandalous by any stretch of the imagination. And the communication was so poorly put out that even the details, oh, that there's also, they're grateful to the Good Samaritans who helped to put together the 2.5 billion. This is a kind of communication a military should put out. Fortunately, not under the uh, current uh, set of uh, services, but. You see then that there's a capitulation. And uh, the other element, of course, yes, we can speak of insecurity, but we must also establish the connection between the nexus between insecurity and the condition of our roads. The badness of the roads creates pockets of slow movement mm. where these people can strike. So I expect that the government will not want it to continue next year. Not that I see what is being done, but certainly it stands to reason, natural justice and good conscience that Government should be able to say, when we enter 2024, you're not going to see this sort of thing. Not to this extent. Okay. Well, we're going to be taking a break imminently. But before we do, let me come to you, Professor Adeni, um, as fairly tightly as you can. For years, so much frustration over the lack of movement on political and economic restructuring. Do you see that going anywhere in 2020? for or will it be stuck in the mire? Uh, no, maybe, maybe for economic restructuring, we'll continue to have um, the kind of experiments, you know, um, that we've been having in the last couple of years where it seems that our leaders hardly have a handle on the right economic direction to tow. Um, we, well, I, th I see this continuing because we are, if, if uh, we were sure of some of these um, problems we're having, you know, where we will be forced to think that uh, we should get away with subsidy, yes, 
yes, we are done with it now, but we are still to see the outcome, you know, the positive outcome or the positive removal of, uh, of the positive outcome of removing subsidy. And secondly, again, we're thinking of whether to float the Naira or not to float it. Now we are floating it, but we, uh, the outcome is upon us and it's unsalutary. So this economic, um, uh, economic up and down, back and forth, will likely continue. But in terms of political restructuring, I doubt if um, any president will have the courage to do um, what agitators have been saying in the past in terms of devolving power, in terms of um, you know, making appointment to be more of merit, you know, rather than uh, pandering to the pressure tactics of, of ethnicists, you know, or religionists, you know, or regionalists, you know, in a situation where we need merit, you know, we need expertise to propel us uh, to the next level. Right, okay. Um, thank you very much indeed for that. And you're watching a special edition of Arise Prime Time. Plenty more still ahead as we continue our reflective journey through the months of the dying year 2023 and look forward to the new year 2024. Stay with us. Welcome back to a special edition of Arise Prime Time. I'm Charles Anyagol. Time flies, doesn't it? It seems like just yesterday that Nigerians sought to put their politicians to the test in pivotal presidential elections in February. But within a few months, it was all over. Bola Ahmed Tinubu was in the Asso Rock presidential villa, and the APC had four more years of power. And then came the policies. Fuel subsidy was removed and the cost of living crisis exploded with energy and food prices shooting through the roof. But perversely, while Nigerians were being enjoined to make sacrifices for the national good, there was that unsavory episode when government fat cats and politicians were truffling up huge amounts of public money to buy expensive cars and even yachts, not to mention going on fancy trips abroad. It was a repellent reminder that not much had changed. And that was just one of many other poignant moments of 2023. Well, let's continue our look back at 2023 and as the old year crashes noisily to a terrifying close we'll also look forward to the new year 2024 what might it hold in store and with me are the noted political scientist professor Jibrini Ibrahim chair of the editorial board of Nigeria's premium times newspaper and senior fellow at the respected think tank the center for democracy and development the political analyst and executive director of Development Specs Academy, Professor K. Kechuku, who's a member of the editorial board of This Day newspaper and is also a professor of strategic management and human capital development, and the current affairs analyst and professor of communications at Bayes University in Abuja, Professor Abiodun Adeniyi. Gentlemen, thank you very much indeed for staying with us. And let me come to you straight away, Professor Ibrahim. Um, all Earlier this year, there was talk about a possible merger of opposition parties to make themselves more electable in 2027, which is the next time you're going to have presidential elections in Nigeria, and to inoculate themselves against the APC. Do you see that potential merger gaining momentum in 2024, or will it be, as someone said, dead in the water? Well, opposition parties need to merge if they are to build up sufficient strength to take over from a ruling party. And we did see with the APC itself, which arose as a merger of different parties and different forces with support from different parts of the country to set up a party strong enough to challenge an existing ruling party. The fact of the matter, however, while analysts and those concerned will say it's good, it almost never happens because it's extremely uh, difficult. Mm. And the key difficulty is that so many people see themselves as possible leaders of this country. And their purpose for being in a party or being in politics 
is to get to the presidency. And therefore, the idea of merger means some of these key players who hope to get to the presidency would not accept the idea of stepping down for somebody else, which would be the inevitable result of a merger in terms of presidential elections. And that's what creates uh, stumbling blocks. And the other issue is that do these parties who want to merge have sufficient shared interest, common principles, to say these shared interests and common principles are more important than me being a presidential candidate? The fact of the matter is that they don't have. So it's not totally impossible, but I don't expect it can happen. Well, let me put that same question to you, Professor O.K. K. Chukwu. What do you see happening with the opposition parties in 2024? We'll talk about that before we go international. Okay, well, first of all, I do not know which parties you mean by opposition parties. I see parties that lost elections to APC. They have so far been very incompetent opposition because opposition is about alternative ideological uh, viewpoints solutions to problems, a shadow cabinet, a clear indication that you're very different from the person you want to remove. Mm. Now, PDP is presumed to be opposition, and yet it sat around chewing its thumb until Bola Tinubu intervened in reverse. Doesn't it have a party leadership? Doesn't it have a council of elders? Doesn't it have a national executive council? So you see that, I mean, even within itself before election, it demonstrated substantial and very impressive incompetence in self-management. As opposition, except coming out occasionally to grumble about something the APC government has done, in what lies its proof as opposition? Then you come to the Labour Party. I'm yet to see that the Labour Party is a party, actually. I'm also yet to see that it's opposition, because we have very informed, intelligent, public statements by the candidate, Mr. Peter B, and sometimes um, by the, his vice, um, uh, that's the um, Now, is that opposition? Public statements on national issues, most of them revolving around uh, the actions of government, some of which are wrong, some of which is criticized. So I do not quite frankly see an opposition. That's number one. Number two, the question of merger does not arise because you must have an ident identity before you merge. And like Professor Jibrin just pointed out, everybody wants to be president. Now, ask yourself, what template are they bringing on the table with which to make Nigeria better? You look at their own affairs, you look at where they are. Okay, your opposition party, you stand for ABCD, where is it? Labour Party members, did they not collect their 450 or 150 million uh, SUVs? Now, the lawmakers were all given money. I think they shared uh, 70 million uh, billion, out of which it is suggested that some go, or they all got 149. Which of them went to the people to share it? So my take primarily is that there is nothing like political opposition with an ideological basis and that the PDP is too, too disorganized to be a party. But he has a lot of big people who are doing more of warehousing, thinking of who to keep out rather than to develop themselves. Then you come to Labour. Labour is not taking the opportunity of a good candidate that attracted the attention of Nigerians to make itself into a political party. It isn't at the moment. Mm. The public statements by the candidates should ordinarily be statements with ideological content coming only occasionally from the candidate, but substantially from the party leadership and party machinery. Charles, my good friend, I see no political opposition. So the question of coming together by individuals who think they are the ones to rule Nigeria is an aspiration to hold office as distinct from political opposition. Right. Okay. Thank you very much indeed for that. And let's gallop ahead. Uh, let me come to you, Professor Abiodun Adeni. Obviously, one of the huge issues of 2023, looking at the sort of the international spectrum now, has been the war in Gaza following those dreadful massacres in Israel and now the indiscriminate killing of civilians in Gaza amid mounting calls for a more sort of permanent ceasefire. What do you think is likely to happen there in 2024? It's a very tough one, you know, uh, going by the history of the crisis in that region. Uh, but again, it has, we have to come back to the question of hope, you know. But before then, again, we we'll probably need um, to uh, look at the opportunities 
um, nested in the abilities of uh, neutral powers or powers that are not directly involved in the crisis to mediate, you know. And the last time when we had a truce, it was through um, the instrument of Qatar, United States, and maybe to some extent United Nations. Um, but these are parties, these are bodies that are still continue to that, that can still continue to make some meaningful intervention, uh, realizing that the parties directly involved in the dispute, the Israelis, the Palestinians are obviously die-hearted, you know, um, very um, strong-willed, you know, against. Um, you know, considering um, for the other. And what do you do when you have this kind of circumstance? Um, it is not just, it is, it's, it's a crisis that is long drawn. We know this, rooted in history, but we're talking about you, how do we uh, mitigate the present pain? You know, something that has become a blight on the world, something that has become um, like a pain on the soul of the world, you know. And of course, you cannot talk about global peace if you continue to have crisis in that region. And it is cri it's a crisis that is actually um, mind boggling. You know, the only thing we can continue to agitate for is for uh, continuous intervention you know, um, by influential groups, uh, nations, countries, multilateral organizations um, that can still have the yes. I mean, they can still have, where we can still have Israel and Palestinians, you know, listening to them as the case could be. Otherwise, I do not see, you know, how the two parties involved uh, can, can probably sit around the table um, to imagine um, the long-term two-state solution that the world has been talking about, Charles. Prof, thank you very much indeed for that. And let me um, stay with that theme and come to you, Professor Ibrahim. Do you think the Israelis who we've seen recently shooting up their own hostages, attacking hospitals and Catholic churches are going to press ahead with their determined efforts to destroy Hamas in Gaza in 2024 and are going to continue no matter what anybody says, including their strongest ally, um, the United States, and of course, President Biden. And, and do you worry about this war spreading in the Middle East beyond the Palestinian territories of Gaza and the West Bank if it continues? Well, my view is that what Israel is doing and what it says it will continue to do cannot be sustained and it carries a lot of risks not just for the region but for Israel uh, itself. You cannot eliminate Hamas in a context in which that community of 2.3 million feels this is the only organization that's actually fighting for them after they've lost their, li their land and they've lost their liberty and are caged in small territories as more and more of their territory is seized. What has been distressing is because Israel believes the great power that supports it will continue to do so, it can sustain it. But you are not going to be able to kill 2.3 million people in the contemporary world. And if they sustain what they are doing, the world will basically rise against them. And you can see from public opinion currently that the world has reached a point where it has had enough of this massacre and maltreatment of millions of people. It's got to stop. It goes to change. And uh, thank you for keeping that reasonably brief, but also making the points that you intended to make. Let me come to you, Professor Oke Ikejuku. What about American politics in 2024? The race for the presidency appears to be between Donald Trump and Joe Biden. Does it look to you like Trump and, um, is going to win? And if he does, what are the implications for the rest of the world? Well, the contest between Biden and, um, and Trump is primarily at the level of values. That's one element that's overlooked. Trump is, uh, belongs to the new, I don't know what new what it is, but is uh, pushing, um, what do you call it, uh, gay marriages and all of that. Remember he Not was- Trump, Biden. Biden, know? sorry. Yeah. He was vice president to- um, to. I mean, Trump Obama. would shudder at the thought. Yeah, precisely. So they are both extremes. And remember, it's also a Biden presidency jointly with Obama that imposed sanctions on us. Raised issues because of the law we made. 
And then if you look at American values under the Biden presidency, you see it leaning towards a liberal disposition that's turning more to license. If two of us say now that what we prefer is to chew telephones for breakfast, they will say it's minority rights. We have a right to do that. So the concept of normalcy <laughs> no longer exists. Trump represents, even if offensive or traditional America, which is conservative, he's pro-life and all of that. Now, this might be, a, if indeed it comes to that, it might be a final contest of two very strong international values. But more critically, whether it's Trump or, or Biden, the situation in the Middle East is likely to be the same. Because if you look at the infra scientific infrastructure of the U.S., it's, 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 it's uh, inhabited by Jews. It's, it's real, they are the professors. So people can speak all the political English about what will suit them. They are the ones holding uh, Silicon Valley. They are the ones holding new this thing, the distribution system. America's dependency on Israel is overlooked. We are seeing only the military might. It's America protecting its interest. So if it comes to push, comes to show that these two men contest, it won't be politics. It will be a, ba a battle between two worldviews. Old conservative America and a new America that's no longer able to say the meaning of the answer to answer this question. What is a human being? Hmm. That's a very interesting line that you've taken there. And uh, let's move away from that, or at least put it in the context of Nigeria, Professor Adeni, because as we know, the year is coming to an end and one of the really big political crises that have been rumbling on as 2023 uh, ends is uh, the crisis in river state. And central to that crisis has been one figure, Nyesam Wike. Is Nyesam Wike's political star going to wane or strengthen in 2024 as a result of that political crisis in River State? Well, uh, Charles, I think I rather just want to elevate um, my response slightly, if I may. Um, it, it's not necessarily about the wiki, you know, but it's about personality politics within our contest. And personality politics thrives, you know, because um, our politics is bereft of ideology, you know, is bereft of value. And of course, we sometimes find it difficult to identify virtue in our politics. You know, um, the political party are, as institutions are very weak. So, uh, because of these downsides, you know, uh, it creates opportunity. You know, for individuals to rise and somewhat become um, larger than life, becoming larger than the party institutions, as the case could be. And that's why we have uh, the many anomalies we have around us, where you have Godfathers emerging, you know, and wanting to continue. Um, their tenure, even after they have technically are constitutionally vacated their position, continue their tenure through proxies, you know. And of course, when those proxies, so to say, realize themselves, you know, want to challenge the tendency for the principal to micromanage them, you know, they, of course, there's, there's conflict, there's clash. And overall, it disrupts the governance system, the governance process, you know, and the people suffer at the end of the day. Um, it just calls for a redefinition of our politics, the kind of politics we want. Um, one that should rather be injected, that should be value-driven, value-leading, um, where ideology can be injected into it, where people can be much more conscientious about serving the people rather than serving um, themselves, where people will privilege you know, the interest of uh, the future of the country, be much more concerned about living legacies rather than self-aggrandizement, realizing that you know, um, the world is, is, is temporary, even their passage is like like a stage, you know, um, like Shakespeare would want to put it. It's like a stage, at some point, the curtains will have to be drawn, you know. Um, if we do not retune ourselves to this realization, then we will not cease uh, to have situations um, where individuals, you know, uh, will become like monsters, you know, troubling a process that should be otherwise salutary, as the case could be, Charles. And that is one thing that we shall be watching very closely, although I suppose most people believe that is going to rumble on for a while, the rocky political situation in River State, rumble into 2024. Um, Professor Ibrahim, we've got less than two minutes left um, to end this very interesting conversation. I wonder if you have a favorite good news story from 2023 that's, in your assessment, interesting and positive. Wow, let's see. 
trap question that <laughs> has floored me completely. There's a, well, sense it, there's a, there's a lot I of things one. that don't floor you, so <laughs> Certainly. it's interesting that this one did. <laughs> Yeah, because uh, the fact of the matter is that it's been an extremely difficult year. And good behavior that we've expected has not come from all the people we have laid a lot of hope uh, it would come from. I think the fact that we, this the year that ended eight years of the Buhari presidency, who had come in with very high expectation that this three famous three-point agenda would be uh, achieved and then none of that happened and governance in fact came to a standstill and now we have a Tinubu who has come on the mandate that he will continue with Buhari's uh, great work and the great work of Buhari is not to govern this country and to let everything collapse you can now understand why I got completely floored by that question. Well, yeah, very briefly, um, Professor K. K. Chuku, about there's 30 good, seconds. There's good news in the fact that um, Tinubu did something about transport. But the thing he has to now note, somebody was talking about going to God is good motors. Their price, which was not quite up to 30, they moved it to 48. <laughs> and then, so you're paying the same thing. That should be investigated so the transporters don't clean out the citizens. Right. The other point, of course, is that we case due for retirement. It will happen. He has chewed, taken more, chewed more than he can swallow. Events are going to build up. He's going to see the consequences of ignorance of cultural anthropology. He played a joker. He don't start a game with your joker. Right. Okay. Uh, it wasn't at the right time that he did most of what he did and the repercussions are queuing up. And in 30 seconds, Professor Biodun. Well, I want us to regard uh, the new year as a new day, which means that um, every of our action on, a, on an everyday basis should um, be, be packed with meaning, you know, um, with determination, and of course, with a resolve to deliver, you know, to deliver something positive. So every year should be like, every day should be like a new year for us, you know, so that we can see result at the end of the day. We have to have to know that um, the creator of, of the world was actually concerned about day and night. Uh, we are having a new year now, courtesy of Emperor Gregory. And of course, there are different um, kind of years across the world. There are different times across um, the world where um, some cultures regard as their own new year. The Chinese New Year is different. The Hindu New Year is different. And we'll have it across the world as well. Yes, we have adopted the Gregorian calendar. That's fine. Okay. But we shouldn't just be weakened by the fact of a new year. Um, our days should be action-packed so that we can have results okay. in all aspects of our life, particularly at the governance level. Professor Abiodun Adeni, Professor Jibrin Ibrahim, and Professor Oke Ikechuku, thank you very much indeed. That's it for this special edition of Arise Prime Time, looking back at 2023 and looking forward to 2024. Join us again next week. From me and the entire team here in Abuja, bye-bye and thank you for watching and have a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. <laughs>